Hello, today we are starting a new unit that is going to be talking all about weather. So let's get started. Okay, so each of these four corners is going to represent a different lesson within our unit. Today we're going to be talking about the leftmost area, part of that. And then we'll also be talking later on about water in the atmosphere, air masses down here, and wind patterns. So our lesson is entitled, The Atmosphere Around You. And the essential question for the unit is, what determines weather on Earth? So let's begin. Here are our science standards, the ones that you see on your report card. These are the same standards throughout the year. So you should be familiar with these. And our substandard today is we are going to be able to develop and use a model to describe how unequal heating and rotation of the Earth cause patterns of atmospheric and ocean circulation that determine regional climate. Today we are going to be focusing on heat in the atmosphere. So the objectives are going to be your questions at the end of this video and I would strongly encourage you to write down the answers as you go so that you have them as you're watching the video. You can pause the video at any time which also brings uh, to mind the idea that this is a longer video. So if you would like to watch half of it now, take a break and then watch the other half, you can do that. That's a good way to watch the video. So here are the objectives. I can explain what the atmosphere is and how it protects the Earth. I can list the three systems that make up Earth's atmosphere. I can list three things that are contained in the atmosphere. I can explain what are the two main gases in the atmosphere. I can explain what air pressure is, and I explain how air pressure changes as altitude increases and decreases, and how air pressure changes as temperature increases and decreases. I can explain what is used to measure air pressure. I can explain how the density of air changes as altitude increases and decreases. I can list the five layers of the atmosphere. I can explain at least three differences between the five layers of the atmosphere. I can explain what provided the energy to drive Earth systems, and I can explain what heat is. I can listen and explain the three ways that heat is transferred. And the final page, I can explain how the three heat transfer methods work together on the Earth. I can explain how heat transfer causes the wind. I can list the two types of wind. I can list two examples of local winds and explain how they occur. I can explain how global winds occur, and I can list five examples of global winds and where they are located. Uh, just a little bit of a hint to find the answers to these questions, these objectives, look at the title on the slide, the question at the top of the slide. So for example, on the first slide here that says, do you remember what are the, what are for what are Earth's four spheres. So it would be the title that you're looking for to get the answers to your questions and then what's the information that's on the slides. So what are the four Earth spheres? See if you remember them. See if you can say them before I say them. Okay, did you hear some hint? Air, water, land, life. They all end with the word sphere. Does that help you remember? Okay, the biosphere. That's the living plants and organisms. Let me get my spotlight here. Okay, the one on the left here is land. What's that called? What's the land called? The geosphere, right? The Earth's surface and plates. There's the geosphere down here. Okay, what about the water? What's that called? I think water is going to pop up next. Yes, hydrosphere, all of Earth's water. And what is the air called? The atmosphere. That's the gases that surround the earth. And today's focus is going to be on the atmosphere. So let's take a look. We've already talked about the other spheres a little bit. Now let's focus on the atmosphere. Which of these spheres is Earth's insulator? Well, hint, hint, since I told you we're talking about the atmosphere, it must be the atmosphere. So if you said that, you are correct. Okay, Earth insulator. What's that? What's an insulator? If something insulates something, it keeps it hot or it keeps it cold, right? 
The atmosphere is the Earth's insulator. It is the thin envelope of gases that surrounds the planet. That is the Earth's at insulator. The atmosphere kind of acts like a coat for the Earth. There's a coat around the Earth. What do you mean by that? Well, how the atmosphere protects the Earth, kind of like a coat protects you when you go outside. So the atmosphere protects the planet from harmful solar radiation. It keeps the planet's temperature within a range that allows life to exist. It protects the Earth from meteoroids. It contains gases that living things need to survive. So the atmosphere has a lot of benefit to us. Even though we cannot see it, it helps us. How does a planet's atmosphere affect that planet? Well, let's take a look at some other planets. So you guys know the story of the three bears, mama bear, papa bear, baby bear, and the porridge story, right? Well. Venus's atmosphere is too thick. It traps in the heat and makes the planet very, very hot. Too hot, that's the porridge that's too hot, that's Venus. Mars's atmosphere is too thin and does not hold in the heat, causing huge temperature swings, including very cold. So there's mama's porridge, too cold, that's Mars. The protection from Earth's atmosphere is always just right, not too hot and not too cold. That's baby bear's porridge, just right. That's your earth. What three systems does Earth's atmosphere include? Well, we got the first one there. Air is in the atmosphere. Water is in the atmosphere. And energy is also in the atmosphere. Even though you cannot see the energy, it is there. It's molecules flying around. All of these parts will interact with each other to give us the weather and climate around our planet. The atmosphere also interacts with Earth's other systems such as the biosphere and the ocean. We'll learn more about how it affects the ocean later on. All motions of the atmosphere are driven by energy from the sun. Keep that in mind. There's our sun. What is the air in the atmosphere made of? Well, it's made of gases. The two main gases are nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen is 78% of the gas in the atmosphere and oxygen is 21%. And then the remaining teeny tiny 1% it's just teeny tiny amounts of argon, carbon dioxide, methane, and ozone. But those are important gases as well. We'll explain that in a little bit. These lesser gases are important because they trap the solar energy so it doesn't escape into space. And we need that solar energy to keep our planet warm. So any little difference in those trace amounts of gases can make a big, huge difference on the Earth. So it's important that scientists monitor the amounts of these smaller gases, because like I said, only slight changes can have big impacts on solar radiation amounts. So here's a circle diagram that shows you that nitrogen is 78%, the red area, oxygen is 21%, the blue area, argon, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone is this teeny tiny sliver of 1%, and then there's 2% water vapor, but that's different than the than the gases. What is the air in the atmosphere made of? Well, we already said it's made of gas. And number two, it's made of water vapor, which is a gaseous, gaseous form of water. So 0% water vapor is in the driest desert area. And in the atmosphere that's in the humid, humid tropics is 4% water vapor. So much more water vapor in the warmer, humid tropics than in the dry, arid deserts. Water vapor cannot be seen, but when it condenses, it forms the clouds we see in the sky. So it's kind of a way of seeing it in a sense. And then the third thing in the atmosphere is fine particles. So we have dust, we have ash, mainly from the volcanoes that erupt, and we have chemicals that get into the atmosphere. These particles can be seen as smog or smoke when they occur in large enough amounts, such as with an eruption, eruption of a volcano. You can also see the dust and the chemicals when you look at smog in big cities. 
So those are the three things that make up the atmosphere, the gas, the water vapor, and the fine particles. What is air pressure? Let's think about that. Hmm, what is pressure? If I put pressure on you, say I put pressure on your thumb by putting a brick on it, what would I be doing? Well, I'd be putting force upon it, right? I wouldn't want to do that to you, put a brick on your thumb. That could really hurt. Well, we know that the atmosphere has gas, water, vapor, and particles. We just said that. Each molecule of these items, molecules you cannot see, but they're there, exerts a small amount of force when it collides with other molecules around it. So it's constantly got all these molecules swimming around out there that you can't see in the atmosphere. The force exerted by the air is called air pressure. Just like the brick puts pressure on your thumb, these molecules in the air, invisible molecules, put pressure on you. It's called air pressure. Earth's gravity will pull the molecules towards the surface of the Earth. And you can see there in that picture that the farther away from Earth you get, the less gas pressure there is. The closer you are to the surface, the more air pressure or the more force is being pushed on you by the molecules. It makes sense. There's going to be more molecules on top of you if you're standing at the top, at the surface of the Earth, than if you're way, 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 way up high almost to space, right? Think about if you were swimming in a pool, if you go real deep in the pool, the water pressure gets stronger and stronger. There's a part in the ocean that gets so deep that people can't even get that far down because the water pressure would crush them. So water pressure is similar to air pressure in that sense. So more air pressure at near the surface of the earth and less air pressure at the top of the earth. So as you move further from the surface, the amount of air particles pushing down on you will decrease. The density of the air molecules becomes less. Density is how many air molecules there are per unit of volume. So the molecules are more and more spread out. That means less dense, right? And they're less squashed together as you go higher up on the Earth. What is the air pressure rules or what are the air pressure rules? Height above sea level is called altitude. So if you're flying an airplane, you fly at a certain altitude. That's how far above the sea level you are. So altitude here is where this plane is, and it's the distance from sea level up to how high you go above. So the higher the altitude, what do you think that means about air pressure? The higher you go up, right, the lower the air pressure and the lower the air density. Less molecules up high. They're not as crunched together. Lower altitude means what? Higher air pressure and higher air density. The air density, the molecules get more squished together. So these are the rules that you're going to want to remember right here. Okay, let's move on. Oh, I forgot my arrow there. Okay, keep going. What else affects air pressure? Well, we've learned that altitude affects air pressure, right? What else? Gravity and your distance from the Earth's surface is not the only thing that affects your air pressure. Temperature also affects the air pressure. How do you think temperature? works with air pressure. Well, when the air is warm, heat energy causes the particles to move quicker, which forces them to spread farther apart. Think about a pan of boiling water on the stove. As you heat it up, those molecules start to get faster and faster and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, right? And they shoot out as steam eventually. So that's what happens to the air. Because the molecules are farther apart when the air is warmer, the air becomes less dense, it spreads out. So warm air is less dense than cold air. And therefore, if they're spread out more, there's less pressure being exerted. So the higher the temperature, the lower the air pressure and the lower the air density. Okay, the lower the temperature, the higher the air pressure and the higher the air density. Again, you're going to want to know this. Okay. 
Here's my arrow. And let's go on. How is air pressure measured? Well, air pressure is measured with something called a barometer. This is what it looks like. It's got mercury inside of it. Mercury is a very toxic substance. You would never want the mercury um, exposed to your exposed to you. So it's inside of a glass tube. As the column of air pushes on the mercury in the barometer, it causes the mercury to rise in the tube. The measurements are read as millimeters of mercury or MMHG. This HG over here, that stands for mercury, millimeters of mercury. Okay, here's a mountain. How can I picture the density of air? Remember we said as you go higher, what happens to the density? It gets less. Well, let's start at the bottom of the mountain. Our air density, what's going to happen? At the bottom of the mountain, you can see all the little molecules real close together, right? Those are little molecules. Of course, you can't really see them. They're invisible, but we're making a model. As you move up the mountain, the air molecules become a little bit less dense. Notice how they're farther apart. And when you get to the top of the mountain, they're even less dense still. Notice how much farther apart the air molecules are at the top of the mountain. So that's how density works with the atmosphere. What are the layers of the atmosphere? So I would say after this um, topic, layers of the atmosphere would be a good time to take a 15 minute break before you come back to the video. So what are the layers of the atmosphere? So as the density of the atmosphere decreases, the farther above the Earth you get, remember you go up, air density decreases, this density change will create what we call layers around the Earth, which are based on temperature characteristics and some other things. So you can't really see these layers, but you know them by their characteristics. So I'm going to remind you um, how to figure out what the layers of the Earth are called and what order they come in, I would say Travis Scott makes thick enchiladas. And so the first couple letters of each word stand for one of the layers of the earth. So you have Travis or troposphere. You have Scott, which is stratosphere. You have makes with this mesosphere. You have thick, which is thermosphere. And you have enchiladas, which is exosphere. So memorize Travis Scott makes thick enchiladas. We'll be talking a little bit more about the layers in the next slide. So let's look at them. What is different about each layer of the atmosphere? One of your objectives is to be able to list three differences between the layers. So let's look at all of them. So here is a map or a model or a picture, if you want to call it of the different layers surrounding the Earth, the atmosphere. So these are all the layers. This is layer one, this is layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five. And after layer five, you get into outer space. There is no more Earth atmosphere. So the troposphere is the layer closest to the surface of the Earth. So this whole area surrounding the Earth and on the other side, if there was the other half of the Earth showing. So here's all the differences in the troposphere. So it's closest to the surface. It's 0 to 12 miles above the Earth. It is the layer that we as people live in. And all of the weather happens here in the troposphere. So we're going to want to learn about the troposphere because we're going to learn about weather in this unit. It traps the sun's heat close to the Earth and it keeps us warm. The troposphere has the highest density air. 80% of the atmosphere by weight. So 80% of the heaviness of the atmosphere is in the troposphere. This is where most airplanes will fly and hot air balloons. And the temperature will decrease as you go higher up. So it goes from about 60 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit when you get to the top, 12 miles up from the surface of the Earth. Well, that's pretty interesting. What's the next layer? Here's our model again. The stratosphere, that's the next layer. So this was the troposphere. And this layer here is the stratosphere. 
Oh, right there. So what do we know about that? Well, this is the layer above the troposphere, and that goes from 12 to 31 miles above the Earth. This contains what you might call the ozone layer. The ozone layer is what protects us from the sun's UV harmful rays. And this layer, the stratosphere, contains 20% of the gases that we talked about earlier in the atmosphere. Helium party balloons make it this far. So if you let go of one of your party balloons or a little child lets go of their balloon and they cry because they see it going way, way, way up into the sky until they can't see it anymore, that balloon will actually go as high as the stratosphere. The stratosphere temperature is cold, but it also increases as you go higher. So it starts at negative 70 degrees, but it warms up to 28 degrees Fahrenheit towards the edge of the stratosphere. Okay, the next layer is the mesosphere. There it is. So it's the third layer. This was the trop troposphere. This was the stratosphere. And this is the mesosphere right here, third layer. So this one is above the stratosphere and it goes from 31 to 58 miles above the Earth. So you're getting pretty far out there now, up in space, close to space. It's where most of the meteors will burn up. So it protects us from those meteors hitting our Earth. And meteorological rockets can reach this layer. These are rockets that help weather guys know what the weather is going to be like. And it is the coldest layer of the atmosphere and decreases as you go higher. It goes from 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a little below freezing, to negative 124 degrees. That's pretty cold. So that is the mesosphere. What is the next sphere? That would be the thermosphere. And there's the thermosphere. So this is the first layer, the troposphere. Let me get my spotlight. This is the stratosphere. This is the mesosphere. And this is the thermosphere. What's different about that sphere? Well, it has layer, it's the layer above the mesosphere, and it's from 58 to 300 miles above Earth, really, really far out there. It has very low air density. Why? Because remember, the higher you go, the less density the air has, the less air pressure. So it has very low air density because it's pretty high and pretty far away from the Earth. It absorbs most of the solar radiation, UV and X-ray. And if you've ever heard of the northern lights or seen them in Wisconsin, if you go up north, you can see the northern lights. It's called the aurora, and this they occur in the thermosphere. This is uh, solar charged particles that are emitting energy, which cause bright lights. Maybe you've seen that. You can also see it in the southern part of the Earth as well. The temperature increases in the thermosphere as you go up. It goes from negative 124 degrees believe it or not, to 2,192 degrees, very hot. But because the air density is so low, you don't even feel it being 2,192 degrees in the thermosphere. That's because the molecules are so spread apart. And the final layer is the exosphere. There it is. And after the exosphere, you get into outer space. So what do we know about the exosphere? Well, that is a layer above the thermosphere and it goes from 300 to 6,200 miles above the earth. Way, way, way out there. This is the last layer of earth's atmosphere before outer space when we no longer have an atmosphere. The air is very thin, mostly made of hydrogen and helium gases. This is where satellites are and spaceships will reach this layer before the spaceship goes off into outer space like by the moon. The atoms escape to outer space in this sphere and it is very hot during the day and, and cold during the night. So the cold temperature at night is 32 degrees and in the daytime it can get to be 3092 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very hot. Okay, now would be a good time after this next slide to take a break if you would like. Can you remember the layers in order? Remember, Travis Scott makes thick enchiladas.
Travis stands for troposphere. Scott stands for stratosphere. Make stands for mesosphere. Thick stands for thermosphere. And enchilada stands for exosphere. So let's see if you can label these. So pause the video and see if you can label one, two, three, four, and five on a piece of paper. Go ahead and then come back. Okay, hopefully you paused it and you came back now. So the first layer, the one closest to the earth is the troposphere. What's number two? The second layer out from the earth is the stratosphere, right? What's the third layer out from the earth? The mesosphere. What's the fourth layer out? Use the Travis Scott makes thick enchiladas. The thermosphere. And the fifth and final layer before outer space, enchiladas, exosphere. You got it. Hopefully you got those right and tried those on your own. So now if you'd like to take a break, now's a good time. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep going. Okay, what provides the energy that drives Earth's systems? I bet you know. Did you say the sun? If you did, you are correct. So the solar energy, which is sun energy, in the form of light travels through space to our Earth. Some energy is reflected back into space, but most is trapped by our atmosphere or observed by, absorbed by the Earth's surface. So our surface of our Earth soaks it in. So if you have like something black, like tar, dark colors will soak in more of the sun's heat. So you, on a summer day, you might not want to walk out on a blacktop road with bare feet because it gets pretty hot because it's soaking in more of the sun's energy. And the sun's energy drives the water cycle and the movement of air. Absorbed sunlight keeps Earth's temperature stable, which means they're fairly constant. They change a little bit here and there, but they keep life going and they are just right to protect our life. So the sun and the atmosphere work together. What is heat? Do you ever think about what is heat? Well, the atmosphere plays an important role in transferring the heat to and from Earth's surface by moving the heat around. Heat is the amount of energy transferred from a hotter spot to a cooler spot. So that's what the definition of heat is. It's how much energy is transferred from one spot to another. What are the two ways? I mean, the three ways that heat is transferred. There's three ways you have to know. Number one, heat is transferred by radiation. Radiation is the transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. They come directly from the sun. Radiation heat transfer does not rely upon any contact between the heat source. The heat source is the sun and the heated object. The heated object is the atmosphere or Earth's surface. Heat is transmitted through empty space by infrared radiation, which is a type of the electromagnetic radiation. So here's a picture over here. Radiation right here. This is radiation from an electric stove that's a form of electromagnetic waves. And that is getting transferred up to this pot of water here. So that is considered radiation. And in the big world with the globe, radiation comes from the sun. So the heat isn't coming from a little electric burner on a stove. It's coming from the great, great big giant sun in the sky. What's the second way that heat transfers? Conduction. Conduction is the direct transfer of heat from one substance to another that is touching. This is called conduction. So they have to be touching to transfer heat. So heat energy from the sun will hit Earth's surface, right, where we talked about some of that heat is absorbed by the land and the water. We talked about the tar and how hot it can get in the summer. Some of that heat is reflected back into space, and some is going to warm the air that touches Earth's surface. Conduction works mostly with solids, but not as well with fluids. So you can look here, and conduction here in our example is that handle of the pot. You never want to touch the handle of a pot without a glove on because you can burn yourself. Why? Because of conduction. The heat is being transferred directly to that handle of that pot. And if you touch it, the heat transfers to your hand. Ouch. 
So with the sun in the atmosphere, the ground gets warm. So the, the air around it is touching the ground and then the air gets hot by conduction. The third heat transfer method is convection. This is heat is transferred by the movement of currents within a fluid. There is no direct contact. Now a fluid is water, like the water molecules in the atmosphere, or a fluid is a gas as well, which is the gas particles in the atmosphere. So in fluids, molecules can move from place to place and take their heat with them. Convection currents are always moving Earth's air and Earth's water to move heat between cool and warm places. Convection heat cycling causes the air to create different weather that we have in our atmosphere. And it also works to create our water cycle, which we talked about a little in our last unit. So looking at our example on the right, convection you can see is the molecules moving around and the heat is transferring, but there is no direct contact. The hotter molecules are near the bottom, the colder ones are near the top. How do the three heat transfers work together? Well, radiation, conduction, and convection work together to heat the troposphere. Remember the troposphere is the atmosphere part layer closest to us closest to the surface. So let's look at radiation, convection, and conduction in that picture on the right there. Some of sun, the sun's energy hits the Earth's surface by radiation and is absorbed by land and water. Some we know is reflected back into space. So that's radiation directly from the sun. Nothing's touching. Air near Earth's surface is warmed by conduction where heat from the surface touches the air around it. That's conduction, it has to have a touching. And finally, convection. When the air near the ground is heated, the molecules have more energy and move faster and farther apart, becoming less dense. Cooler, denser air is going to sink and warmer, less dense air is going to rise. The upward movement of warm air and the downward movement of cooler air happens by convection. And this moves heat throughout our troposphere layer. So just remember that hotter or warmer air rises and cooler, denser air sinks. That's why if you have a cold day outside, it's colder near the bottom of the ground than it is up on top. Or if you have heat in your house, it's, it always feels a little cooler if you lay on the floor than if you're standing up because the colder air is going to sink, the warmer air is going to rise. Okay. Okay, next question. How does heat transfer cause the wind? That's a big wind, isn't it? We now know that cooler, denser air sinks, right? It has higher air pressure and warmer, less dense air rises because it has lower air pressure. This happens by convection. Wind is the movement of air parallel to Earth's surface from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure. Wind causes unequal heating over the Earth. What are the two types of winds? Well, the first type of winds are called local winds. These are areas of unequal heating over small areas where winds blow over short distances. So two examples of local winds are sea breezes and land breezes. So let's talk about them for a second. So sea breezes are gonna occur during the day. So what happens is the land is gonna heat up faster than the water can heat up because the land can absorb more of the sunlight. So that means that the air above the land is going to get hotter than the air above the ocean or the lake. The warmer, less dense air above the land is going to rise, right? Less dense rises. The cooler, more dense air over the water then is going to move into the low pressure area over the land. So it's going to blow. This will cause a local wind from the sea, 
during the day. So during the day, if you're near the ocean or a big, big lake, like Lake Michigan, you're going to get breezes coming off of the lake or off of the ocean towards the land during the day. However, at night, the opposite happens. The breeze switches directions. Why is this? Well, at night, the land takes longer to cool off. The water will cool, um, the water will, um, no, I'm sorry. The land cools off faster than the water. So the water is going to be, the air over the water is still going to be warmer than the air over the land. So now the air above the water is going to be warmer and less dense. And so the air above the land, which is more dense and cooler, is going to move into the low pressure area over the water. This will cause a local wind to blow from the land. So if you're near the sea or a big lake at night, the direction of the wind, the local wind is going to go towards the sea instead of towards the land. Let's take a look at that in a model and see if we can see that a little better. So local winds, remember sea breezes are cooler air over the sea sinks during the day and blows toward the land. So here's a picture diagram. So you're going to see the sea breeze during the day is going to blow towards the land where this arrow is right here. At night, you're going to get a land breeze. Cooler air over the land is going to sink at night and blow towards the sea. So the land breeze at night is going to blow out towards the water. So hopefully that helps you see that a little bit better. What are the two types of winds? We talked about local winds. The second type are called global winds. It's got the word globe in it because these are areas of unequal heating over large areas where wind blows over long distances across the globe. Global winds, globe, they go across the whole earth. So global winds work like land and sea breezes over a larger area, right? So the air near the equator that gets hotter than the air near the poles, right? At the top and the bottom of the earth, it's very, very cold. So there's a lot of colder air at the top and bottom. That's because the middle of the earth gets the sun's direct light um, more so than the top and bottom of the earth because the earth is tilted. So you're going to get more direct sunlight and hotter, warmer temperatures near the equator, the center of the earth. So at the center of the earth by the equator, the warm air is going to rise because it has less air pressure. Remember, warmer temperatures create less dense air. The colder air near the poles is going to sink, right, because it has higher air pressure. So then the colder air is going to want to pull in underneath the warmer air. It's going to fill it in. So the convection currents are going to cause big global winds as the air moves from the poles to the equator. So here's a little example. Notice how the arrows here aren't going straight, though, are they? They're curving a little bit. Why are they curving? Because the Earth's rotation, remember, the Earth is rotating it all the time. It's spinning, spinning, spinning. So the air is going to curve a little bit. So you're going to get curved winds. So there's a picture of some of those curved winds. You're going to see a different diagram on the next page. Okay, so let's take a look at global winds a little further. So there are five different types of global winds. The first is called the polar easterly. Cold air that blows east at the top and bottom of the globe. These are the polar easterlies, they're at the top and the bottom. They are the cold air winds, global winds. And then second, you have the westerlies. These are warm air that blows west below the polar easterlies. So these are right below the easterlies and they're warmer air, okay? The third type of global wind is called the horse latitudes. That is a belt of calm air occurring below the westerlies in the northern hemisphere and above the westerlies in the southern hemisphere. This is calm wind and just a little rain occurs here. So there's the horse latitudes. See how they're below the westerlies in the top of the globe and above the westerlies at the bottom of the globe. They're called the horse latitudes. Calm, no rain or hardly any. 
the fourth type of global wind is called the trade winds. These are two belts of winds blowing steadily towards the equator from the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Both they, they blow towards the equator. They carry a lot of rain and they have warm winds. This is where a lot of storms will occur. These are the trade winds right there. And the final global winds are called the doldrums. Have you ever heard of somebody being in the doldrums? Something that's kind of like, oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. They feel kind of like down, right? Well, doldrums are winds directly above and below the equator, and they are very calm. So you can't even say they're much of a wind at all. And sailors have a hard time in sailing in this area because there are no wind. There's not very much wind to push their boat along. So this is where you will find the doldrums, right there in the center. These are all types of global winds. We're going to talk more about them later. And then also note that there are also smaller global wind cells within each of the fine five main global winds on both sides of the globe. So these, um, let me grab my spotlight here. These little circular patterns here, they're gonna keep following. They're all around the earth. They're only showing them on the right side in this diagram, but they're also on the left side. And they have the circle patterns kind of with the five main global winds. Okay, we are done. So these are the questions that you have to answer. There's several of them. I believe there's a total of 20 questions. So you just go back through the slides and your answers will be found on each slide. Explain what the atmosphere is and how it protects the Earth. List the three systems that make up Earth's atmosphere. List the three things that are contained in the atmosphere. Do you remember the three things that were contained in the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. Gas water vapor and particles, right. Explain what are the two main gases in the atmosphere. Remember the two main gases? Nitrogen and oxygen. What is air pressure, right? It's the pressure of the air molecules, right? Pushing down on you. Explain how air pressure changes as altitude increases and decreases. So as you go up in altitude, what happens to air pressure? decreases, right, and vice versa. Explain how air pressure changes as temperature increases and decreases. Explain what is used to measure air pressure. Explain how the density of air changes as altitude increases and decreases. List the five layers of the atmosphere. Travis Scott makes thick enchiladas, right? And number 11, explain at least three differences between the five layers of the atmosphere. I gave you many more than three. You can pick your three favorites for each layer. Explain what provided the energy to drive Earth's system. Explain what heat is. List and explain the three ways that heat is transferred. You remember those three ways? Radiation, conduction, and convection, right? Explain how the three heat transfer methods work together on the earth. Explain how heat transfer causes the wind. List the two types of wind. We talked about them. They're called local winds and global winds. Give two examples of local winds and explain how they occur. Explain how global winds occur list five examples of global winds and where they are located. Okay, so I believe that is all and we will see you back for our next lesson. Good luck on those questions. Go back through the slides. Bye.